The next question is, is Heather's, and it is, God allow, true or false, God allows trials in our lives to see if we are strong enough to maintain our faith in him. I'll post that jet now. Hmm. Okay. All right. Let's ask uh, Sister Lisa to go first on this one. Come on, get that microphone working, Lisa. Okay, uh, I would say false. Uh, if that's the way it's phrased, because it's like putting it on God that he's tempting, testing, or trying you. And James says that let not that man think, you know, well, well actually, I'm quoting the wrong scripture, where the Bible says that uh, no, no man is tempted, tested, or tried of God. So it, de it depends on what we're talking about, because I don't like the way that I, I'm not picking on anybody. I'm not trying to hurt anybody's feelings. The way that it's phrased is like almost a setup. Um, be, uh, could you read that one more time? Because I want to I want to show what I think is wrong with the way the question is phrased. Should you say it again? It, it The question is, I'm sorry, one second. Um, true or false, God allows trials in our lives to see if we are strong enough to maintain our faith in him. Uh, I'm going to say false. I don't like the way it's phrased because it's, it's making it out that God is like, like God don't know whether or not, you know, where your faith is. I've always had a problem with people that took this position. Now, if you're coming at it from the perspective that it's going to demonstrate to you where your faith is, then I might not have such a big problem with it <laughs> because we're fickle, we falter, uh, we miss a bunch of stuff. So a lot of times, if there is a trial, it's for your perfection, it's to strengthen you, and things of that nature. It, but God knows exactly where I am. He's not, you know, let me find out where Lisa is today. I'm just not sure. If that's just, that's not God. He knows exactly where I am. If anything, it's going to be a demonstration to me where I am. And what I need to work on and uh, whether or not there are strengths and or weaknesses in my faith. So it will be a demonstration to me and perhaps to others, but not not to him. So I, I kind of take issue with the way it's phrased. I'm not trying to pick on anybody. I think it's a mindset we've always had as believers where we think God is testing us. Yet James is clear he's not testing you. So. It depends on what we're talking about. And in the context of just the simplicity of the way the question is phrased, I'm going to say false. And I stated why. Okay, thanks. All right, Steve, what do you say? Um, <clears throat> I pretty much uh, echo what Lisa said, uh, and I want to add to that, that uh, if you... The way it's worded uh, has a couple connotations in it. Uh, the first three words, does God allow trials? Yes. For what purpose, to me, is the more accurate question, because the latter half of the question stating that does God allow it to see if we can maintain our faith in him, to me, suggests that uh, that there's some type of merit base to our faith being maintained for our salvation, which is tacitly false. Um, the strength of our faith does not determine our salvation. It's the Savior who determines our salvation. And all we need is just a little bit of faith. To believe in Jesus just just enough um, and so there's that but in our life in our walk with God does God allow trials yes he uses them to teach us that's pretty much I think what Lisa was saying is God wants to, to train us up and you do that you know you, you, you can't uh, you don't really grow without having something to face and to work against. Um, uh, first, 
I want to read just a few verses, um, but this is this is definitely this got to allow trials. Yeah, um, the one thing I'll say for sure: God does not tempt us. We are tempted of ourselves, as James says. Um, but it says uh, in First Peter one. Verse 3, 1 Peter 1, verse 3, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy hath begotten us again unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Christ of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled, and that fadeth not away, reserved in heaven for you, who are kept by the power of God, through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. Wherein ye greatly rejoice, though now for a season, <clears throat> if need be, if need be, if there's a need for this, ye are in heaviness through manifold temptations, that the trial of your faith, being much more precious than of gold that perisheth, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. So the purpose of the trial is to bring you through fiery, through the fire to make you more like Jesus. That's the purpose. That's what we're to learn and learn, like, kind of like Ben was saying, that, you know, you take a look at, What's happening? Why are you reacting in a certain way or whatever? You know, what in your life is in need of work on? Um, and so I think that's important to remember that, that these trials happen and that God uses all things. Another verse, God uses all things, all things for the good of them that love him. And sometimes that's some fiery trials that we go through. Does God allow them to happen? Yeah. But I'll, I'll give you a, a quote by my one of my favorite pastors, preachers, said to trust God and that he trusts God through these fiery trials and things because God is the thermostat in our trial. And he knows how hot that trial can get before you would fall apart completely. And he regulates it to where it's to the point sometimes where it breaks you so that he can remake you without crushing you. So um, I forget what, oh, the question of, of does God allow trials for to see if we can maintain our faith in him? No, because God knows our faith. He's trying to teach us and grow us to being more like his son. It's never about something he does not know. And it's certainly not about some type of faith level we need to earn to either keep our salvation or gain salvation because that is of Christ alone and not of us. So thanks. Okay. Amen. All right. Brother Ben. Well, I loved Lisa's answer, but I loved, um, I wouldn't say, but I take out that, but I loved Lisa's answers and I, and I loved Steve's even more. Um, and I was going to quote that same verse in Peter. I think that was a great verse, and you you explained it per perfectly. It was awesome. Um, so not much I could say above beyond that. There's a similar verse in Romans uh, that says, uh, Romans 5 says, verse 1, Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. So right there, you're already justified. You're already uh, eternally uh, declared righteous. So whatever happens after that is is that doesn't have any bearing on your eternal salvation. But uh, it says, but but you know, through that faith, that continued faith, 
we have access to his grace in which we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. And not only that, but that we glory in tribulations, knowing that tribulation produces perseverance and perseverance, character and character, hope. Um, so I think that, like uh, Steve said, that it, it's, it's, it's designed to build our character. Um, I used to, you know, I used to, when I ever had like a, something that bothered me in my faith, like I found like a, like a soft spot that, you know, like I, I just felt like, ah, I, I just got to plug it with something. Um, you know, it, this is my early days. Um, I used to, I used to, you know, just have a sense of dread, like, oh no, I'm gonna have a crisis of faith. I feared I'd have a crisis of faith. And again, it's just, it just irrational fear. It's like, I wouldn't sit down and think about it. Um, uh, again, it was a very, very much a babe, very much tossed to and fro at the time. But now, when I first of all, I, that doesn't really happen to me anymore. But uh, anytime it does, I, I look forward to it because I know it's going to build me up. It's God always, God is every everything that really I thought was a weakness. God has oh in my faith, God has always turned it around and made it actually a, a point of rather than a point of weakness, He turned it into a, a point of strength. Um, it, it's like it's like it, it totally t turned around, uh, you know, completely three sixty um, or one eighty, I should say. Um, and there's another another verse too. I thought of this John 15, um, where Jesus says again, this is often twisted by Lord Chippers, where he says, "I am the true vine. My Father is the vine vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, He takes away." And again, that word "takes away," it, it's actually uh, we talked about this before. It's it's a it's actually uh, talking about viticulture. It's it, it's uh, it's the the science or practice of uh, of um, uh, agriculture or uh angel probably knows a, a better word but um it's the practice of you know uh growing up plants and and and, and so they grow properly and uh, taking care of them that way and so when it says takes away that also can be translated as lifts up and so like for example if i have a branch on my you know if i have a, I have a, a plant in my window if i see it's starting to rot or starting to sag i will lift it up and put it up against the window to, to brace it and give it more sunshine um, and I think that's exactly what God does here too. If he sees you starting to, uh, you know, a trial is starting to, to make you wane, uh, in terms of your walk or just your, your, what, you know, you you're less concerned about the things of the Lord. You're starting to, the world's starting to suck you in. I think God will, uh, use any way he can to get your attention. It may be a trial, but he does that to lift you up, to bring you back into him and, and to seek him even further and to, uh, to abide in him so that you can bear more fruit. Um, because it says actually the next verse, it's John 15 verse three says you, after he says that every branch takes away, uh, and every branch that bears fruit, he prunes that it bear, bear, bear that it may bear more fruit. And verse three says, you are already clean because of the word I've spoken to you. So again, the clean is it being declared righteous, but the, the fruitfulness is a total, total, again, that's another, uh, 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 application of the parable of the sower again proving that only the first soil was not saved the 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 the, th the third the second third and fourth soils were born again they were the seed sprung to life it germinated it brought new life now whether or not they're going to bear new fruit that's a whole other matter but they're clean they're clean and he declared righteous um so that's all that's all i would add i, I think it's a uh I think God does bring drink trials, but again, it's it, it's always to, designed to to grow us, not to uh, tear us down. Yeah, I think we've had a lot of good answers on this question, Angel. How can you improve on that? Well, everybody's pretty much taken the words out of my mouth, so I figured I would um, read this uh, psalm that really just reflects what I what I feel uh, is the real purpose of uh, the trials we go through. Um, Psalm 91, 1 through 16. He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will abide in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say to the Lord, my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust, for he will deliver you from the snare of the fowler and from the deadly pestilence. He will cover you with his pinions and under his wings you will find refuge. His faithfulness is a kind, is a shield and a buckler. You will not fear the terror of the night, nor the arrow that flies by day, nor the pestilence that stalks in the darkness, nor the destruction that wastes at noonday. A thousand may fall at your side, ten thousand at your right hand, but it will not come near you. You will only look with your eyes 
and see the recompense of the wicked, because you have made the Lord your dwelling place, the Most High, who is my refuge. No evil shall be allowed to befall you, no plague come near your tent, for he will command his angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways. On their hands they will bear you up, lest you strike your foot against a stone. You will tread on the lion and the adder, and the young lion and the serpent you will trample underfoot, because he holds fast to me in love, and I will deliver him. I will protect him because he knows my name. When he calls to me, I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will rescue him and honor him. With long life, I will satisfy him and show him my salvation. And I love that verse because in my experience uh, so far, um, every test I've gone through, not really test, but every trial, I've never felt like it was a test. I've always felt that it was um, an opportunity for God to show me uh, how consistently and uh, unfailingly he has my back. And even, even when I think that he's going to let me slip um, or that he has let me slip, uh, it's almost it's almost as though he allowed it just so that he could uh, he could see my face when he when he catches me at the last minute and you know uh, delivers an outcome that is even better than uh, the outcome if I had never gone through the uh, the difficult time in the first place and so at least for me I think a lot of the trials that we do experience are really just um, a God's way. Of proving of proving himself in the end, proving um, that he's right there with us all the time, and uh, I, I'll never, it, you know, it, I know it doesn't have anything to do with um, with him trying to to figure out where I'm at because, you know, he does this even at times when I'm distant from him. When I'm my earbud died. Hopefully, you guys can hear me. Um, he, he does this um, at times where I don't feel like I merit it at all, right? So um, I, you know, I just think that even if it seems like, you know, that verse would imply that we'll never go through anything at all. I think what it really means is that he's always going to, to be there to deliver us uh, in ways that, I, and it's almost like in ways that only we personally could understand you know, that it had to be God, God had to know, you know, the, the innermost fears of our heart and that he, uh, he often will step in at the last minute, you know, to, to protect us from, you know, something that we dread the most or, or, or to even, even give us a kind of peace through the situation that we never thought was possible uh, and that we would never have thought was possible all our lives while we were dreading this, uh, potentiality, um, in advance, you know, it's just, uh, uh, it's not so much a test as a, it's like a, it's like a bonding experience in my, in my, in my opinion. So hopefully you guys can hear me. My earbud died. Yeah, I heard you perfectly. Great, 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 great. <laughs> uh, okay. I guess everybody's answered, but uh, Heather and me, Heather, I, did you submit the question, Heather? Yes, sir. Okay. So you go last. Okay, well, first, let me say that a couple of people uh, referenced the sentence, uh, how it was written, and and uh, I, I think that we should always remember that um, those of us who are submitting questions, and I, I, I hope everybody, if you haven't submitted any questions, please, uh, that's another way we need you to participate. Uh, write down some kind of a statement and say, is this true or false? Uh, and... Uh, um, it's not a trivia thing like, uh, okay, uh, 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 let's say uh, uh, Abraham's wife was uh, named uh, Sarah, true or false? No, we, no, we want questions that, that they're subjective. Uh, it's a matter of opinion to a certain extent, how, we're gonna, uh, how we interpret it, how we answer it, not just something that uh, can be stated in, you know, in, as, a, as a data point or fact. Uh, but please, everybody submit the questions. But when we do submit a question, it doesn't mean that the question was submitted because we are uh, making a point that we uh, this is what we believe. Uh, and maybe the question is written in a way to actually make you to see if you will find the fault in it. 
because we're intentionally putting a, a snare in it, something that is a problem to see if, if you catch it and, and, and identify it as, as whole. Well, obviously this is, this is wrong because uh, we, we don't want to, uh, we don't believe that uh, uh, God is, uh, uh, um, this is a matter of us keeping our faith. Uh, uh, we know that's wrong. Um, the, uh, but another thing in this particular question that could be construed is that uh, God is making things happen in order to test us. And uh, it's important we understand the, the sovereignty of God. Uh, see, the, the sovereignty of God uh, is the foundation of Calvinism. But they, they have what I call hyper sovereignty and uh, hyper when you put a hyper in front of uh, the word it means uh, you've gone too far with this it's 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 an extreme point of view and it's it's wrong because you've taken it too far so um, the word sovereign and sovereignty are not in the bible or at least the, the kjv uh, you probably find them in other translations but in the kjv the word does not appear but uh, that doesn't mean the concept is not valid, just like Trinity is not in the Bible, but we know that the doctrine of Trinity is true. Uh, so I, I, I'm not disputing that God is sovereign, but this is, the, this is really the way the sovereignty of God works. In God's sovereignty, God has the right and power to do whatever he wants, and he's just, so it's, it's good. Whatever he does is good. But in his sovereignty... He exercised his right to say, I'm going to give man a free will because only if man has a free will can we have a love relationship. Because if he doesn't have a free will and I impose it on him, it's not really love, it's rape. So it's it's not, uh, he God needed to give us free will in order to have, uh, give us this opportunity for this love relationship. Uh, so... Uh, uh, God was in his sovereignty, gave us free will. That's uh, that there's no contradiction. If we have free will, it doesn't mean that God's not sovereign. Um, uh, but God is still able to exercise his power anytime he wants. He can enter the, uh, our, our world and, and, and determine whatever he wants, but he's not determining everything the way the Calvinists believe. Calvinists believe that Everything I just said, God made me say it. And, uh, and those people who uh, reject Calvinism, as I do, guess what? God made me reject it for some reason, <laughs> you know, because God controls us like a puppet. We're programmed like a robot. We don't have any thoughts of our, of our own. The problem with that, though, is that really that makes man as an innocent puppet. So all the sin of the world... God is the guilty party because God is controlling us and making us sin. So uh, and that's the reason Calvinism is a, the most evil philosophy ever invented. Um, that because they take the sovereignty too, too far. But God, um, God uh, the things happen. And because it's a fallen world, bad things happen. There's death, there's sin, there's crime. All these things are going on. God's not making it all happen. And he's not doing these things to test us. Um, however, God can sometimes intervene and, and maybe test us or do something that is, okay, he is making that happen for a reason. Uh, but um, these things are really, as I think Steve said is, uh, and Lisa, that it's, it's really uh, not to test us, but uh, our trials are there for us to learn and grow. And I, I thought a lot about this the last few years, as I've gotten older, I'm 70 now, <laughs> and there's no denying it. I'm an old man now, <laughs> and I every time I develop something like even the simplest little thing like brushing my teeth, I, I'm I'm kind of a real anal or OCD about a lot of little things. I like to perfect things, and even the simplest little task, I, I'm always trying to find a way of making it better developing it and perfecting it even better. And so 
I, I reached a point in my life where I'm thinking to myself, wow, I, I really have got, lot, got it together as far as I've learned a lot. I've, I've been able to have these life lessons, like just simple things like, like, okay, it took me 50 years to learn that I needed to write down a budget and live on it. And it sounds like an obvious thing, but most people don't do it. But it can be the difference between being, you know, uh, successful and 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 uh, con having every, what you need and and being in st stressed out all the time because you're you haven't lived within your means. And, and but simple things like that. It took me a long time to learn things. And but as I've learned these things, I've reached a point where I'm thinking, I'm finally at the point in my life where I really got it together. I really think I've really, really. I don't want to say I've perfected life. No, I'm not that egotistical, but I do feel like, okay, now that I'm, I really know what I'm doing, it's time for me to leave. What's the point? I finally, I finally learned, learned and, and I'll be gone. So uh, it's, it's a strange thing, situation. I, I mean, as, as I don't know if everybody as they get older thinks that such things, maybe some people get older and they don't ever uh, learn and, and, and develop uh, in the way that I've described. Um, but uh, maybe uh, um, uh, the idea, the, the question is, are, are we going to um, have trials and learn from them and grow? Uh, I certainly do not think that it's there because God is testing our faith. Um, all right. I guess I covered uh, everything. Uh, uh, Heather, okay, you submitted the question. So uh, give us the official answer. Well, you all have given amazing answers. And with the information that you were provided about this question, I'm very pleased with the answers that you've given. Um, there is more to this story, a lot more to this story, actually, um, starting with the way that the question was worded. When I submit questions, I tend to take what I'm reading in the Bible at the moment and all of the arguments that I've had with, and I don't mean arguments like yelling arguments or anything, just debates that I've had with um, non-believers um, in my life and come at the, the passage that I'm reading with how would I defend this, especially some of those harder to read passages like where Abraham is told to sacrifice his son or where Lot is tried, or where Jesus tells Peter that the devil has asked permission or is requesting permission to sift him. Um, and so because of that, um, looking at it from a non-believer's standpoint, the question is would be then, does God allow these things to test our faith? And the answer is absolutely not. God does allow these things but it's not to test our faith to prove to him that we are faithful. It is to test ourselves and so that we know where we stand and to grow us and to mature us in, in our walk with Christ. And so that's, that is where um, I was coming from with this question. And um, I believe that even in, for example, um, the story of Abraham, he passed the test before he ever made it up the mountain because um, in verse, let me see, I just had it. Okay. In verse five, Abraham um, says to the young men who are with him, stay here with the donkeys, with the donkey, the lad and I will go yonder and worship and we will come back to you. He passed the test before he ever made it up the mountain. So um, was it a test that God gave him to prove that he still had faith in him or that his faith was strong enough to go through this test? No, but we go through things in our lives sometimes that can shake somebody who doesn't know God and doesn't have a strong relationship with them, with him. Um, like when my, my son was born um, and he was my oldest and he was in the NICU um, because 
his blood sugar dropped, my husband was shaken. And that was the beginning of my husband deciding that he didn't believe um, because he felt like somebody had sinned here and he couldn't figure out who. And someone was being tested. But the bottom line is my son was conceived to a mother who has diabetes and who had to take medication the entire time that I was pregnant. And because of the fact that I took medication, because sin entered the world, death entered the world, disease entered the world, because of those things, my son was born with low, low blood sugar and he spent a week in the NICU. It wasn't anybody's fault and God didn't do that to us to test us, but it did test my faith, not that it test it was God's test, but it helped to build my faith, to strengthen my faith, knowing that I've made it through this, not because of who I am, but because God gave me the answers that I needed. And so when God provides or allows a test for our faith, it's not for him, his sake, it's for ours, first of all. Secondly, he will always give us the strength to make it through that test and the wisdom to understand why it happened. I mean, also, too, with regards to that last, uh, the, about the trials, I think God also, like someone also mentioned, a commenter actually in the, uh, for the, in the, in the voting system basically said God does it to build our faith. And I think some people, we all alluded to that, but I think that is definitely a, a, one of the major things he does is, is it's to grow our faith. Um, and in fact, you know, for example, I was thinking just last, and Heather brought this up, so I thought I'd tie this in. Last week I was talking about, you know, did Abraham ever doubt? And one of the things I mentioned was that, you know, when God said uh, your your descendants will be as the number of the stars, God believed him and took it, God counted it for for him, for righteousness. And, you know, again, God didn't like promise it to him. He just said this was going to happen. He didn't make a promise to him or anything like that. He didn't cut a covenant with him or anything else. But when uh, he just simply believed it, took God his word, he believed it. And that, that's when he was accounted righteous for righteousness. But in the next sentence, basically, uh, God promises us some land. And then, you know, that's an earthly thing. That's when Abraham kind of, I think, kind of dropped back into his flesh and said, oh, how will I know this is going to happen? And then, and then basically God gives him a ritual he can perform to show him <coughs> that, that that was the case. But in Hebrews, what's interesting, and this is about building your faith, in Hebrews, it says, in verse, uh, Hebrews 6, verse 13, it says, For when God made a promise to Abraham, because he could swear by no one greater, he swore by himself, saying, Surely, blessing I will bless you, and multiplying I will multiply you. That is a quote from Genesis 22, 17. But God never said those words in Genesis 15, I think it was, when God when Abraham simply believed on believed what God said was going to happen. Um he said God, Abraham simply believed him, uh, took him at God as, at his word. And it was only 22 verses later, I'm sorry, that was Genesis 15, but it was years later at the sacrifice of Isaac is when God said, I will surely bless you. And so that's when uh, Abraham received the promise. So it says, and, and if you think about it, you know, that a Abraham knew that he was going to uh, have a son uh, through which, a promised son through which his, through which his descendants would be the numbers of the, uh, as numerous as the stars, and you knew that was Isaac. Well, that promise, that very promise, is in jeopardy when God told him to sacrifice Isaac. And you know, rather than uh, leaning on his own understanding and saying, "Oh, how can this be?" He simply took God at His word and um, leaned on God's understanding, trusting that God knew what He was doing. And that that was a trial of his faith, and it and it grew his faith. And the reason it grew his faith is because after he did that, that's when he received the promise. From from God said I now I'm going to swear you took me at my word before uh, in, in Genesis 15 that I'm going to make your uh, descendants as, as numerous as the stars but now I'm going to promise it to you and that was after he sacrificed Isaac that's when he says surely blessing I will bless you and multiply multiplying I will multiply you and that's when he swore by himself because he could swear by no one greater and that's when it says in Hebrews six uh, uh, chapter six verse sixteen for men indeed swear by the swear by the greater and an oath for confirmation for them is an end of all dispute thus god determining to show more abundantly to the heirs of promise the immutability of his counsel confirmed it by an oath that by two immutable things 
in which it is impossible for God to lie, we might have a strong consolation who have fled for refuge to lay hold of the hope, hope set before us. So that consolation was that double promise, basically, or that, that second, that's what God promised him to it. So, if, again, people think Abraham had a perfect faith always. If Abraham had a perfect faith, he wouldn't need a strong consolation because he would have continued to take God at his word from the first uh, promise or the first declaration that this was going to be so. But he received God's swearing uh, promise, and that gave him strong consolation. Um, to, again, to, to show more abundantly, and it grew his faith. So God tested his faith, and he passed that t test of faith. And so God grew his faith uh, by, again, swearing to himself that he, you know, that he cannot, uh, that he can't swear by anyone higher, so he swore by himself that he was surely going to uh, bless and multiply Abraham. So I thought that was pretty cool. Okay, praise the Lord. Uh, yeah, let me go back. I want to go back to James. I wanted to read the passage that I had referred to earlier and then point something out that I want to make sure is made clear. In James chapter 1, verse 12, it says, Blessed is the man that endureth temptation. For when he has tried, he shall receive the crown of life which the Lord hath promised to them that love him. Let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God, for God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempteth he any man. But every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. Had a really good Bible uh, teacher, pastor, many years ago, and he pointed this out concerning this passage. The word tempted there means tempted, tested, or tried. Now, if you go to, um, I'm looking at Strong's Light. The in the Greek it's G three nine eight five. The Greek word is parazo. And Thayer's definition is to try whether a thing can be done, to attempt endeavor. Now, this is from the old covenant usage, by the way. To attempt endeavor to try to make a trial of or a test for the purpose of ascertaining his quantity or what he thinks or how he will behave himself in a good sense, in a bad sense, to test one's maliciously, craftily, to put to the proof of his feelings or judgments, to try to test one's faith, virtue, character by enticement to sin, to solicit to sin, to tempt of the temptations of the devil. And then after the Old Testament, the usages of God to inflict evils upon one in order to prove his character and the steadfastness of his faith. Men are said to tempt God by exhibitions of distrust as though they wished to try whether he is not justly distrusted and by impetuous or wicked conduct to test God's justice and patience and to challenge him as it were, to give proof of his perfections. And then it says um, in Strong's definition 3984, to test objectively, that is, endeavor to scrutinize, entice, to discipline, assay, examine, go about to prove, to tempt, to try. So that pretty much covers it. It says don't even let them say any of that that is coming from the Lord. Now, as people so astutely pointed out, that when these things happen, it's not the Lord doing it. It's, it, like you said, a part of life. It's the devil. It might be your flesh. It might be the world. It's not God. And so we have to try to keep that in remembrance. And then what it will be is a demonstration of your faith. Who's it in? Are you relying under your own power? Are you relying under your own understanding? Or are you going to lean on the Lord to get you through whatever that is? And it will be a demonstration of your faith, not only to the devils, not only to the Lord and to yourself. Remember, the Lord already knows, but it's still going to be a witness. So I think we have to keep it in the proper perspective. God's not doing anything to you. Now, he'll use it for your good and his glory, but he's not the one doing it. He, he'll just allow it. And there's certain things if, um, if you know and you've had this experience, you've experienced it growing up and you may have experienced it, I'm sure, with your own children where they're going through something, you didn't do it to them, but you'll use that as either a teaching experience, as a time to either comfort them, to nurture them, to strengthen them. It's that kind of thing. You ain't doing it, but you'll, you'll help get them through it. You'll bring them through it. And it will either strengthen them or show them where their weaknesses are that, 
things that they need to work on. So that's my little rant on on finishing out on that thought. Now, <laughs> for tonight.